and free on all platforms. Video of two American men taken captive in Ukraine, released today by Russian state-controlled media. One of them appears to be reading a coerced message, and a third American is still missing, believed to be in southern Ukraine. Despite the videos, the Kremlin denies having any information about the Americans. ABC's James Longman is there with the latest. Vestavia Hills, Alabama, yet another shooting at a common gathering place. This one at a church potluck dinner. Three people are dead, a fear spreading across so many communities. Guns in the hands of some seeking to do harm. ABC's Elwin Lopez is there. Plus, we'll speak with a former U.S. Senator who lives in that community. Authorized, the FDA gives the go-ahead for Pfizer COVID vaccines for the youngest children. But after the long wait, some parents are saying not so fast. Dr. Alok Patel joins us to address their concerns. Record inflation, will recession follow? Growing concerns from Wall Street to Main Street. ABC's Deirdre Bolton joins us to break down what you need to know. Colombia heads for a fateful election as two anti-establishment candidates battle for the presidency. Both are promising big changes for the longtime U.S. ally. ABC's Victor Okendo reports. Things are very tense and very uh, polarized. And the dude is now the old man. Bill Lipoff speaks with Jeff Bridges about shooting fight scenes in his 70s, his real-life confrontations with death, and his character in the new FX series. He believes by his own righteousness, what he feels right, he's willing to die for it. Eh? Good evening. I'm Stephanie Ramos in for Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. We're tracking new developments in that deadly church shooting. But first, we begin with the three American veterans missing in Ukraine. Two of them believed to be in the custody of Russian forces and now concerns they could be used as pawns in the war. The men, all military veterans, among as many as 20,000 foreign volunteers who have traveled to help Ukraine in the fight. And late today, retired Marine Captain Grady Kuprasi has been identified as a third American volunteer now missing in Ukraine. His family has not heard from him since April. What they're telling us that's coming up. The two seen here, they're both from Alabama, seen in this photo together, which is circulating online. And tonight we have new images from state controlled media in Russia. One of the Americans delivering a pro Russian propaganda message we cannot share. Tonight, the Kremlin is denying they know anything about the men. President Biden has been briefed and is urging Americans to stay away from the fight. James Longman leads us off with the latest. Tonight, state-controlled media in Russia has released videos of two Americans taken captive in Ukraine. 27-year-old Andy Huynh of Alabama was recorded here delivering pro-Russian propaganda, presumably coerced into doing so. ABC News will not air the contents of the message. The Russian news outlet RT says the video was recorded yesterday in a detention center in the Donbass region of eastern Ukraine. Another video shows 39-year-old Alexander Druki, also from Alabama, delivering a message to his mother. Mom, I just want to let you know that I'm alive and um, I hope to be back home as soon as I can be. The two went missing about a week ago, fighting alongside Ukrainian forces outside Kharkiv in the country's northeast, which is very close to the Russian border. Back home, the families of the men are desperate for any information. It's stressful um, because we don't have answers at the moment. Waiting is always very hard, but we are encouraged. And tonight, a third American is missing in Ukraine. He's identified as retired Marine Captain Grady Kerpas. His family tells ABC News they've not been in contact with him since late April, where he was believed to be in the Kherson region of southern Ukraine. Family spokesman Don Turner served with Grady for 12 years in the Marine Corps. Couldn't stress enough the sheer fact that uh, he cared more about others than he did himself. Despite the release of the videos, the Kremlin earlier today denied having any information at all about captured Americans. And today, President Biden said the whereabouts of the men are unknown. I have been briefed. We don't know where they are, but I want to reiterate. 
Americans should not be going to Ukraine. But hundreds already have, according to conservative estimates. Last month, ABC News interviewed soldiers of the Ukrainian Foreign Legion. At least 25 in this unit outside Kharkiv were American. Really, we just wanted to help the Ukrainian people. We believe that um, their, their fight is a just fight, and we wanted to be here and support them. And James Longman joins us now from Dnipro in eastern Ukraine. James, are these captured Americans considered prisoners of war? Are they entitled to any protections? Stephanie, the main issue here is that these men are being held by Russian-backed separatists in the east, not by Moscow itself, and that gives the Kremlin a certain degree of deniability. We've seen them stage these show trials before of foreign fighters. Two Brits and a Moroccan were put on trial uh, by this same group, and they were found guilty of being mercenaries, and they are actually sentenced to death. So they don't regard them as prisoners of war. They do regard them as mercenaries, and that does complicate this entire situation. Situation. Stephanie? It certainly does. James Longman for us in Ukraine. Thank you so much. Now to another act of gun violence in this country, this time at a church in Alabama. Police say a gunman opened fire, killing two people and injuring another. Elwin Lopez is in for us tonight. Tonight, authorities charging a 70 year old man with capital murder, accused of killing three people inside an Alabama church. Uh, they act a shooter situation multiple patients at this time. Late today, officials say Robert Finlay Smith, seen here in this newly released mugshot with a black guy, opened fire at St. Stephen's Episcopal Church during a potluck dinner on Thursday. He produced a handgun and began shooting, striking three victims. The founder of that church saying his wife spotted the suspect there more than once. My wife says that he looked uh, like he didn't take very good care of himself and he had a hard time communicating with people. Police crediting another attendee with stopping the shooting, taking the gunman down and pinning him until officers arrived. It was extremely critical in saving lives. Uh, the person that subdued the suspect, in my opinion, is a hero. Officials identifying the victims as 75-year-old Sarah Yeager, 84-year-old Jane Pounds, and 84-year-old Walter Bart Rainey. One of the kindest people that you can imagine. If you wanted to pick out somebody that just you'd love being with, it would be Bart Rainey. And Elwin Lopez joins us live now. Elwin, what are you learning about a possible motive? Yeah, Stephanie, police believe that the gunman acted alone and that there are currently no threats to the community. Tonight, officials have not released a motive. And Stephanie, I also spoke to the founder of this church just a few moments ago, and he says that this will become a place of peace once again. Stephanie. All right, Elwin, thank you so much for staying on top of that. Joining us now for more on the church shooting and how the country can move forward as we see more and more mass shootings is former Alabama Senator Doug Jones. Thank you so much for your time tonight. We really appreciate it. And it's just it's just so sad that we have to continue talking about incidents like these people just going to church, going to the grocery store. It's just horrendous. This shooting was just a little more than a mile away from your house and, and so close to where your kids go to school. Talk to us about your community, which is a suburb of Birmingham, and what is your community going through right now? Well, I think the community here is in shock. This is a wonderful little community, and that area is a small little commercial area that's kind of nestled in between a lot of residential uh, areas. And this is a community that sees uh, just random acts of crime, you know, the typical car break-ins, burglaries of homes on occasion, but nothing like what we've seen here, and especially not at a church. And I'm hoping that this will kind of wake some people up who tend to get a little bit complacent about gun violence going on in the country and saying it can only happen somewhere else. I think it's a really important thing. But, you know, this church has been there for a long time. Uh, Reverend Carpenter, who uh, founded that church, has been a stalwart in this community. And they're going to they're gonna be strong. They're going to survive. But it is going to take a little bit of, of love and tender care to, to get through all this. Absolutely. It just keeps happening over and over again. Do you know any of the people who were at the church last night? You know, I don't know any of the people at the church. You know, interestingly, I think I've met this guy uh, that actually did the shooting last night. Really? I, well, yeah, he was a gunsmith. He actually has a federal firearms 
dealership uh, or at least a license to sell guns, which is kind of interesting under a lot of the circumstances we see today. And he's done a gunsmith work at a gun shop that I frequented, in fact, represented about 20 or 25 years ago. I didn't know him. I could just probably met him in passing. But the fact that he is a licensed gun dealer um, and then would just show up at a church that he didn't go to and just randomly pull out a pistol. And this was this was, you know, this was a, an elderly group. The victims here are all in their 80s. I mean, it is just stunning to this community about how they did. And I, I did not know any of the victims uh, who lived in different places around the community. Uh, incredible that you had met the the, the alleged shooter here. Uh, sir, you were a senator for three years, from 2018 to 2021. I remember your campaign very well. I covered it there in Alabama. Uh, you I remember. Do you remember? <laughs> it was a few years I ago. Uh, you you must know some uh, the folks that are on that group that are trying to strike that bipartisan gun deal. Uh, the lead negotiator for the GOP, John Cornyn, was booed today in Texas defending that deal. Do you think this will actually get to the finish line? Well, I'm still very hopeful. You know, I, I think we have to remain hopeful. This is a a moment. Now, this is not the first moment we've been in in this country. We're seeing tragedies. Uh, the, involving children, as a matter of fact. and But I, the, it seems like today there's something different. I really believe that uh, Senator Murphy, Chris Murphy, and Senator Blumenthal, Senator Tillis, uh, Senator Cornyn have done a wonderful job of trying to figure out how to move forward. This is not going to be everything that I would do. It wouldn't be everything I think Democrats would do. But it's also going to be a little bit more than I think that we're seeing from uh, the right and the uh, very conservative. And it's really a sad state of affairs uh, where a, a, a leader like John Cornyn gets booed by members of his own party for what will be very modest changes, but could be significant changes, both not only with some modest gun uh, restrictions, but importantly, mental health uh, funding, which has eluded Congress from doing for so many years. So we. I'm going to remain hopeful. That's all we can do right now. Uh, you are also the former U.S. attorney there in Alabama, and I understand you've been following the January 6th hearings closely. The DOJ is obviously investigating as well. Do you believe what you've heard so far could result in potential criminal charges against former President Trump? Well, certainly it could, uh, uh, Stephanie. I mean, I think right now we've still got a little ways to go. What, what folks often not really uh, f fully realize is that so much of what you've seen with the committee can be used as evidence in a criminal trial. Uh, you've got to have someone there to cross-examine witnesses. Uh, and so we, I think the DOJ's got a little ways to go. Obviously, this is building one hell of a platform for them, you know, with all of the testimony that is under oath testimony uh, that they have. That's very important to have that under oath testimony. So I, I think they're building an interesting uh, potential case for Department of Justice, but there's a lot of things that go into it before you make a final decision on either the a former president or any of his top aides. We'll see how it all plays out. Senator Doug Jones, thank you so much for your time tonight. Good to see you again. Good to see you, Stephanie. Take care. Tonight, more than three weeks after that horrific Uvalde school shooting, a Texas House of Representative committee has been holding hearings this week about what happened. Our Mireya Villarreal is in Uvalde tonight. Mireya, this was the third day of these hearings. What do they say is the end goal? Well, you know, Stephanie, I think right now what they're hoping to get is as much information as possible with the focus on obviously what happened that day, what happened inside the school. And yes, of course, the response as well. But really what they're looking for is information that will help, you know, give other school districts around Texas and for that matter, really around the country, a better understanding of how to prepare in these situations. Um, obviously, this committee um, cannot charge anybody criminally, but they will be sharing this information with the public. And Mireya witnesses included a lot of school district employees. Is everyone cooperating? 
So initially, yes, everybody has been cooperating for the most part. We know that for sure the school district has provided a number of people to come out here and, and present from everybody from maintenance to really the superintendent. Also, some of the teachers today, we heard from them uh, in executive session, or at least the panel heard from them today. Uh, police officers also with the school district. Initially, there was some concern about police officers with the city of Uvalde. They had been uh, asked several times to come out and to testify in front of this panel, but they hadn't yet agreed to it. Late today, they did agree to send some representatives from the police department. The concern was the district attorney for Uvalde County had told them that while the criminal investigation is still ongoing, she recommended to, say, to stay tight-lipped about the investigation and about the details of what happened that day. She warned everybody that um, any information, anything that they testified to inside this hearing can potentially be used in you know in criminal charges somewhere down the line so again there was hesitation but it does sound like the Uvalde Police Department is uh, back on track here a really interesting update and Mireya you've continued to stay in touch with family members ever since the shooting what are they telling you tonight you know really that the biggest word I can use is they're frustrated frustration right now I mean, these families have been waiting now for almost a full month to get some sort of answer as to how, why this may have occurred. You know, it was really tough today, Stephanie, as we watched for the second day in a row, one of the family members of one of the victims, um, uh, Uzziah uh, Garcia, um, his uncle is his legal guardian, and he was sitting at the steps of City Hall, right down at the bottom, waiting to go in, trying to get answers. He has been here day after day, just like we have. Today, he actually waited outside Rob Elementary to speak with panel members and to beg, really to plead, for some sort of information. There is a lot of frustration here and a lot of distrust families want answers. They understand that this investigation is still ongoing. They're not asking for everything. They just want some idea, some perspective, because a lot of them still have children that are expected to go to school in just less than two months. Understandably, they are frustrated. Those families have been through so much. Mireya, thank you so much. Thanks. 24 hours after the January 6th committee revealed former President Trump was told what he wanted Mike Pence to do was illegal. The former president has gone after his former vice president again. Here's ABC's chief Washington correspondent, Jonathan Carl. After three hearings documenting the horrors of January 6th, the attacks on officers, the threats against Mike Pence's life, and 24 hours after the January 6th committee showed that Donald Trump was told what he was asking of his vice president was illegal, Trump today denied the undeniable facts, saying only a, quote, small number of people went to the Capitol that day, and many did nothing wrong. It was a simple protest. It got out of hand. The January 6th committee showed just how close the mob calling for Pence's execution got to the vice president at one point just 40 feet away. Today, Trump attacked Pence once again. Mike Pence had a chance to be great. He had a chance to be frankly historic, but Mike did not have the courage to act. Trump's own advisors have testified that they told him what he wanted Pence to do was illegal. Today, he repeated lies about the election that his former attorney general said he told him were just not true. I did not agree with the idea of saying the election was stolen and putting out this stuff, which I told the president was As for those being prosecuted for the attack, Trump said he might pardon them if he becomes president again. All this comes after the warning from respected conservative legal scholar and retired judge Michael Luddick. That's still Donald Trump and his allies and supporters are a clear and present danger to American democracy. That federal judge laying out a clear warning. John Carl joins us now live. John, the Justice Department has been calling on the January 6th committee to turn over the transcripts of its interviews with key witnesses. Could that happen soon? 
Uh, it could, although Benny Thompson, the chairman of the committee, has said that he will not turn over the transcripts until their hearings have wrapped up. Those hearings are scheduled to be concluded by the end of this month. I am told uh, that the transcripts could be turned over shortly after that. In other words, as early as July. Stephanie? All right, John Carl for us in D.C. Thanks so much, John. Thank you, Stephanie. Now to the pandemic. The FDA today cleared the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines for children under five and as young as six months old. The CDC is expected to follow suit this weekend. Every state has pre-ordered doses except for one. Florida's Department of Health is rejecting federal guidance. ABC's Steve Osinsami is at the CDC in Atlanta. With a stamp of approval from the FDA, drug makers tonight are shipping millions of doses of the COVID vaccine for the youngest children in America to pediatricians and pharmacies around the country. Whatever vaccine your healthcare provider, pediatrician has, that's what I would give my child. Children under five could start getting the shots on Tuesday after the CDC gives a final approval expected this weekend. But many parents in Florida may have to wait. It's the only state that didn't order doses of the children's vaccines ahead of time. It's infuriating. It's making it very difficult for parents that do want to get their children that are under five vaccinated. State officials are disagreeing with scientists and public health experts at the CDC and the FDA, saying that they don't support giving the COVID vaccine to healthy children under the age of 17. Doctors can get it, hospitals can get it, uh, but there's not going to be any state programs uh, that are going to be trying to, uh, you know, get COVID jabs to infants and toddlers. We need to make vaccine access as easy as possible for providers and parents. And that just isn't happening in Florida right now. Thanks so much for that report, Steve. The wait for a COVID vaccine for the, for the very youngest children is over, but many parents still have questions about whether it's right for their little ones. For insight on that, we turn to ABC News medical contributor and Stanford Children's Health pediatrician, Dr. Alok Patel. Dr. Patel, thanks so much for joining us. It feels like we've been through this discussion and approval process so many times. What's different about this approval for the youngest kids? Well, Stephanie, it's good to be here. Thank you for having the conversation. I think one big difference that we're seeing right now is the level of scrutiny that is happening right now over the past few months in terms of the right dose, safety, and the immune response for this vaccine. And that is something that I hope gives every parent out there, anyone who has any questions, some security, just knowing that about how much detail is being mm -hmm. combed through before this vaccine is fully approved for those kids under the age of five. Now, a recent Kaiser Family Foundation survey found just 18% of parents said they would get their child under five vaccinated as soon as the vaccine came out. What is your advice uh, to parents who are still hesitant? My, my, the first thing I, I tell to all parents is be empowered and make sure you're asking those questions because your central role is to defend your children against any threat out there. But make sure you're getting your advice from sound sources. Now, I'm not surprised, Stephanie, to see that the Kaiser Family Foundation showed only 20% of parents they were going to rush out and get there because there's swirling headlines everywhere talking about how kids don't need the vaccine. We know that's not true, that the vaccine doesn't work based on the immune data we're seeing right now. We do see that's true. There's parents out there saying and worry that the vaccine may not be safe, where there were no serious adverse events reported in the clinical trial for either the Moderna or the Pfizer shot. And we have this real world data based on the millions of shots that have been given out in a slightly older age group, which gives us really good data to look after. And so based on the combination that kids still need this, that it's safe and that it's work, I hope parents make the right decision. And if they're on the fence, that they chat with a reliable source. And also, doctor, I'm sure there are so many parents out there that may say, well, my kids already had COVID. Aren't they protected? What do you, what do you say? Do they still need a vaccine? Stephanie, I say I have the same question because guess what? My 14 month old who is screaming in the other room just <laughs> recovered from COVID herself. Now, the truth is, is that we don't have a great sense of how long or how robust that natural immunity really is. So the recommendation is still, even if your child recovered from COVID recently, that you go out and you get the vaccine. And we have studies previously showing us that that hybrid immunization, meaning natural immunity plus vaccine acquired immunity is great in terms of long-term protection, potentially against any future variants. So that is the right move to make. The research and the science is there. Dr. Patel, thanks so much for joining us. That's what it is. Stephanie, thank you.
Now to the economy and growing fears that we may be headed for a recession. The Federal Reserve's decision this week to fight off soaring inflation with higher interest rates has many fearing the measure will backfire and instigate a recession. Weary investors continue to pull out of the stock market today, capping off a week of sell-offs. And there are early signs. Higher interest rates are hitting the housing market. New home building is down 14% since last month, but energy prices remain sky high. The average price of gas is $5 a gallon, and rising food prices are sending many to local food banks. This one here in Fort Worth, Texas, they gave out essential groceries to nearly 4,000 people this week. But they say many more still need support. ABC's Deirdre Bolton joins me now. Deirdre, give us a quick overview. Why are investors and economists worried that a recession is around the corner? Stephanie, for all the reasons you just mentioned, I mean, inflation is at a 40-year high, and this is for non-discretionary items. This is for things that people need. Obviously, the more that people spend on basics, the less they can spend on anything discretionary, and consumer spending is two-thirds of our economic output, of our GDP. So the less that we feel comfortable collectively, in general, the worse the economy does. Also, statistically, we're dealing with the Fed and some pretty tough decisions that the Fed is trying to make. And the Fed in modern times has actually only been able to engineer a soft landing once in 1994, that was Greenspan's Fed. And the difference between now and then is that the Fed was actually, as people say, ahead of the curve, had started raising rates before seeing inflation at these levels. We've spoken about the CPI report, 8.6% for the month of May. So we are not at all ahead of the curve. So that is why investors are worried because this time really does look different. It is concerning. And this week we've, we've been talking a lot about this, but what can families do? The number one thing, if people have credit card balances to try to pay those off, because those are by far the most expensive forms of debt. It's like 16 and a half percent as a national average. And then there are apps to help you conserve a little money. For example, Waze is a good app for gasoline, Gas Buddy as well. You put in your zip code, you can find the cheapest gas in your area. There is a food shopping app called Basket. It's not the only one out there, but if you have a go-to list of items, you put it in the app, it will show you the prices in your neighborhood groceries, and then you can compare and contrast. Oh, that's smart. That's definitely smart. For those who are invested in the stock market, recent weeks have been alarming for them. What's the advice for, for that group? I think for the next 12 to 18 months, we just have to accept that the stock market is going to be volatile and to be choppy. Um, but the longer term bets on the U.S. economy, on innovation here have paid off for decades and decades. But it is true in the near term, we probably just have to get used to a little bit of anxiety. Then there are also products out there which are somewhat slow and boring products, but may fit into someone's portfolio. For example, I-bonds, you buy them directly from the Department of Treasury. If you are able to lock up your money, they can pay you about 9.5%. And we've been talking about the housing market, how that's slowing down. What's advice for, for somebody who's trying to sell their home or even trying to buy a home at this time? If you're selling, try to price your home right, try to entice buyers. As for buyers, just try to have as much as you can to put down. And then on top of that, you can sometimes buy points, buy a lower rate from your bank. You work with your bank on that. Some really great information. <laughs> Thank you so sure. much, Deirdre. Thanks. When we come back, the nation of Colombia on edge. Their runoff presidential election just days away. An election engulfed by controversy with what could bring fundamental shift to the country. Plus, the longtime leader of the WWE stepping back from his duties. What led to the decision? With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast, now streaming on ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know? 
need to know. To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. The hottest views in daytime are happening right here. We talk about things on this show that people don't talk about. That I can't wait to see. Honest takes from strong women. We need all hands on deck and we need it right now. This is the time to speak out. Unafraid to get real. We stick by our points of view. We're all seeing it differently and that's the beauty of The View. And that's why the most watched number one daytime talk show is The View. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Is that the gun? That's not the gun. What is it? I won't ask you again, then. Are you a Nazi? <laughs> the deeper you go into the black market, you could be putting your life at risk. The darker it gets. Why hasn't anyone come out and spoken? It's about the money, that's all we do. Trafficked. New episodes Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Terror for a couple kidnapped while hiking in Colorado. Investigators say they were taken by a man at gunpoint. A witness alerted authorities and stayed on the phone until police found the victims and took the suspect into custody. Thankfully, no one was hurt. This weekend will lead to drastic change in the nation of Colombia. The presidential runoff elections will with two very different candidates. How will the relationship with the United States be impacted? That's the question. Here's ABC's Victor Okendo with the details. In Colombia, an unpredictable and deeply polarizing race enters its final stage. On one side, Gustavo Petro, a leftist and former guerrilla member. On the other, Rodolfo Hernandez, a wealthy businessman dubbed the Colombian Donald Trump, both heading to a runoff this Sunday in a presidential election like no other before in Colombia. Colombia, for most of its history, has had in power a, a ruling elite. And now you've had this situation where people are very tired of right or left. And this is completely unprecedented for Colombia. The future president will face serious challenges, a country with a poverty level of 40 percent and like the rest of the world, still grappling with the effects of COVID, inflation and the 2021 social upheaval. Protests in Colombia's major cities devolving into chaos and bloodshed. And the protesters are now calling for real economic reform that will aim to close the gap between the rich and poor in their country. Hay todo un volcán que está a punto de estallar. Estamos cansados con la corrupción. And with candidates on complete opposite sides of the spectrum, Colombia will experience a fundamental shift. Buenas noches. Things are very tense and very uh, polarized. There's also tremendous disinformation against both of the candidates that has stirred up tremendous passions. Rodolfo Hernandez was the big surprise during the first round. A mí no me gusta. A political outsider who has refused to debate and has mostly campaigned through social media. Él tiene un estilo eh, muy auténtico. Es, tal vez eh, no es libreteado. Que se vea un político que siente, le da alguna ira o le da tristeza. Y él, él no, no tiene reparos en ocultar sus sentimientos. He promises a small government and to end corruption, but critics say he does not have a formal plan and it's unclear who would make up his cabinet. No politiqueros no quiero, 
politiqueros sobran, son los que arruinaron a Colombia. No, no voy a hacer eso. Confíen en mí. Mírenme en los ojos. Léame en los labios. No les voy a fallar. His competitor, Gustavo Petro, a senator and former mayor of the capital city of Bogotá, a leftist who has promised to boost state involvement and make changes to the economic system. Estamos muy cerca de ganar la presidencia de Colombia y de que ustedes se vuelvan poder. El pueblo negro de Colombia, las mujeres, los jóvenes. A past in a guerrilla group that demobilized in 1990 and declarations that he would resume dialogue with Venezuela, raising concerns. If elected, Petro would be the first leftist in power in the history of the nation. What Petro has said is that Colombian economy can no longer be focused on extractive industry, you know, which is mining, oil. I think that that would uh, cause fear in investors of instability or uh, knowing what will be done in terms of the economy. Many of those investors in the United States, in both the mining and manufacturing sectors, the U.S. also imports crude oil from Colombia. Petro lo que va a hacer es poner mucho más grande este estado para que llegue a diversas este, capas y no solo a las élites donde Hernández ni siquiera le conocemos mucho las ideas. A Petro se le conoce más un programa eh, eh, estructurado. The alternative, an unpredictable leader, according to his critics, with an unclear agenda. Thank you again, Mr. President, for being here. Changes in the United States' third largest trade partner in Latin America that could make the markets react. President Biden named the country an important non-NATO ally earlier this year. Whatever changes might be made, there will be actual dialogue. Changes both Cesar and Juan hope will steer Colombia in a better path. La esperanza mía es que quede el ingeniero Rodolfo Hernández y podamos preservar nuestro, nuestro sistema económico. Me da una esperanza porque la mayoría de población colombiana está con unos índices de pobreza muy elevados y pues la, la sociedad en general necesita ayudas del Estado. An important election we'll certainly keep monitoring. Our thanks to Victor. Still ahead here on Prime, he's a movie icon taking another swing at TV. Our Phil Lipoff sits down with legend Jeff Bridges, whose new show proves old guys have moves too. Plus, Warriors, they win again. Their road to recovery, victory rather, they've recovered. They've certainly recovered. And we take a look at how this NBA dynasty was built by the numbers. But first, our tweet of the day, a glimpse inside the United States versus G. Gordon Liddy trial, courtesy of the U.S. National Archives, as we mark 50 years since the Watergate scandal. The deeper you go into the black market, the darker it gets. Traffic Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions, straightforward reporting, no spin, no hype, no bull. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos, the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Okay, we made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Is that the gun? That's not the gun. What is it? I won't ask you again then. Are you a Nazi? <laughs> the deeper you go into the black market, <laughs> the darker it gets. Why hasn't anyone come out and spoken? It's about the money. That's why we do it. Trafficked. New episodes Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. These days, with so much going on, it's hard to keep up. While others are recapping yesterday's headlines, we're bringing you the right now. This is the busy border crossing. Steel barricades, another strike. The right now look at the day ahead, how it affects you and your family. Record high gas prices. The threat of cyber warfare. Is peace possible? World News Now beginning at 2 a.m. Eastern, followed by America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. Streaming here on ABC News Live.
Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. As of today, in a big way, we have inaugurated ABCNews.com. A lot has changed in our world since Peter made that announcement. But what hasn't changed is the commitment to groundbreaking reporting and innovation at ABCNews.com. And here's to everything ahead. Welcome back. Golden State Warriors fans are celebrating another championship tonight, sealing the team's place in history as one of the great NBA dynasties. Let's take a look by the numbers. Four. That's the number of championships the Warriors have now won in the last eight years. It's one of the most successful stretches in NBA history. In the 103-90 victory last night over the Boston Celtics, the team went on a 21-0 run, an NBA Finals record. Overall, the team has seven championships total, the third most in NBA history. Finals MVP Steph Curry is now averaging 32.5 points per game in title clinchers for his career, trailing only Bulls great Michael Jordan. And here's a crazy stat. Warriors coach Steve Kerr has won 12% of NBA Finals all time, five as a player and four as a coach of the Warriors. The Warriors were 15 to 50, the worst record in the NBA just two years ago. They are now the first NBA team ever to go from worst to first in a three year span. At five to one, the Warriors are the early favorites to win it all again next year. One final note, the championship parade is set for Monday in downtown San Francisco. This will be the first parade for the team in San Francisco. They played in Oakland from 1971 to 2019. Congrats, guys. Coming up on Prime, an American teacher jailed in Russia is sentenced. How much time he'll likely spend in a maximum security prison? Plus, the end of an era for daytime TV. A look at the finale of the Wendy Williams show. And a movie legend takes on TV, filming a thriller while unknowingly having cancer. Our Phil Lipoff sits down for a candid conversation with Jeff Bridges. But first, here's a look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust, and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. National parks are incredibly safe places, but crime will happen. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. I know what happened and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart that he did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. 
This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news. Free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. A sigh of relief for many parents across the country with the CDC expected to sign off on vaccines for children between six months and five years old. Emergency use authorization for the Pfizer and Moderna shots for that age group could come on Saturday and shots could go into arms next week. The FDA signing off this week saying both vaccines appear safe and effective despite mild symptoms like irritability and fever. Pfizer's vaccine is a three-shot series, one-tenth the size of the adult dose. The company's early data showed it was 80% effective in preventing symptomatic COVID. Moderna's vaccine, only two shots, is a quarter of the size of the adult dose. Early data showed it was about 40 to 50% effective at preventing mild infections. Both generated antibody levels against the Omicron variant similar to those seen in adults. An American teacher detained for over a year in Russia has been sentenced to 14 years in prison on charges of large-scale drug smuggling and possession. Mark Fogel taught at the Anglo-American School of Moscow and enjoyed diplomatic immunity before 2021. In August, he was reportedly detained passing through customs at a Moscow airport where trained dogs allegedly found marijuana and hash oil in his luggage. Interfax reported in April that Fogel had pled guilty to some of the charges but denied intent, saying he needed the marijuana and the hash oil for medical purposes. Vogel is one of several Americans being held in Russian prisons, including U.S. Marine Paul Whelan and basketball star Brittany Griner. Pro wrestling guru Vince McMahon is stepping back from his position as CEO and chairman of the board of WWE, pending the outcome of an investigation into alleged misconduct by McMahon and a top executive. The decision comes after a recent Wall Street Journal report that said the board was investigating a secret $3 million settlement that McMahon agreed to pay a departing employee with whom he allegedly had an affair. In a statement, WWE said that McMahon's daughter, Stephanie McMahon, will serve as interim CEO. CEO and chairwoman, Vince McMahon will still keep his responsibilities related to the organization's creative content. The UK has ordered the extradition of WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange to the US to face spying charges. Assange has been in a years-long battle trying to avoid facing trial in the US, where he faces charges over the publication of a huge trove of classified documents. Assange is expected to appeal. Supporters of Assange argue he's entitled to First Amendment protections for publishing documents that exposed US military wrongdoing in Iraq and Afghanistan. Wow, everybody, this is a big day today. After 13 seasons, the Wendy Williams show has signed off for the last time. The namesake show herself was not at the final episode. She's been absent due to health issues, with the show featuring guest hosts throughout its final season. Sherry Shepard hosted the finale, and she and the studio audience paid tribute to the TV legend in the end. And I want to say, Miss Wendy, you are an icon, and you are loved by so many. So many. More air travel cancellations, up to 1,200 flights grounded today. Airlines grounded 1,600 flights on Thursday alone as storms swept through some of the nation's busiest airports. According to experts, a rising number of flight cancellations are the result of airlines struggling with staffing shortages, especially pilots. Unions have repeatedly complained there's not enough staff to follow through on the flights that are booked. Now to the extreme weather heading into the weekend, a one-two punch of severe storms in the east. More than 3,000 flights canceled in the past 48 hours and the dangerous heat for nearly half the country. Senior meteorologist Rob Marciano is tracking it all for us. Hey there, Rob. Hi, Stephanie. Uh, like we've been saying all week and seeing uh, this extreme heat is kind of feeding some of these thunderstorms. We saw that today, 99 degrees breaks a record at uh, Reagan National in D.C., and we had over 200 damaging storm reports today, mostly across the Mid-South and the Southeast. 
Uh, Tennessee seeing near golf ball size hail. Kentucky seeing winds over 60 miles an hour, and there's trees down all over that area. That line is now moving into the I-85 corridor. Here it is along uh, the Carolinas and through Richmond, Virginia. Raleigh just about to get uh, hit there, as well as Columbia, South Carolina, which already had some serious flash flooding. So those watches are up for the next couple of hours. It does bring some relief over the weekend for the eastern third of the country. Here are temperatures for Father's Day, but look at the heat building in the central U.S. Fargo up to 103, 97 in Minneapolis, Sioux Falls 99 and upper 90s to near 100 all the way down to Texas. So this will be shifting over to the much of the eastern two-thirds of the country come the beginning and middle part of this week. Chicago, you're right back in at 98 degrees expected on Tuesday. Wednesday, Little Rock 100, 101 in Atlanta and Raleigh near 100 as well. Another heat wave is building into next week. Stephanie, stay cool. All right. Thanks so much, Rob. And happy Father's Day to you, by the way. Enjoy it. Thank you, Stephanie. Thanks. The saying goes, age is nothing but a number, right? Well, a movie icon who is taking another swing at TV is hoping to prove just that. Jeff Bridges stars in The Old Man, airing on FX and Hulu, as a former CIA spy forced to go on the run. And as Bridges filmed the thriller, complete with fight scenes, he was unknowingly living with cancer. Our Phil Lipoff sat down with Bridges and has the story. Hey, kid, it's me. They found me. Jack, are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. The dogs are fine. Thought I covered the tracks. You and I were not going to be able to talk again. Remember that I love you. That I'll always love you. They have a lot of love and respect for you as a person, as, a, as an actor. And when this role came to you, um, what was what was your first thought when you read whatever it is that you read about? Well, it's I, I followed my normal mo, which is to resist. <laughs> you know, that's my first call. Resist it uh, because I know if I do this, I won't be able to do that, I'm, and I don't even know what that is. My dad, Lloyd Bridges, he did he had seven, six or seven TV series. And I remember as a kid how hard he worked and how frustrated he was about the time and, you know, the execution of pulling it all off. So I, you know, I said, that's a reason to, good reason to resist. So I thought, yeah, do an experiment, Jeff. Just, you know, at least meet these creators and have a talk. Jeff, in an action role, this guy who is, the, the show is called The Old Man. It's yeah. an older guy, but it's a guy who's lived a life just what he's been able to do physically and for the country. And then all of a sudden you're, you're living this life as an older man and yet yeah. you're getting into these brawls and then you're showing these big bruises on your oh, yeah. side. And what was that like to at your age yeah. um, do these kind of fights? Anymore you send it, man, I'm sending back in bags. Well, I enjoy, I've done a lot of fights in my career and I love uh, doing it. It's like, you know, some a like, kid thing or something. But I think this is the most extensive fight stuff I've done. We were lucky to have, you know, again, two master stunt coordinators, Henry Kinji and Tim Connolly, who, you know, choreographed this thing. And uh, it's like in, when you're acting a scene, you want it to be real and you want it to be exciting and surprising. And those guys apply all that to this, this fighting, you know. So, these fight so scenes are very real. Very real and, yeah. One thing I love about your character and about characters, period, what motivates them, you know, it's not good and evil, it's not white and black, right and wrong, there's a little bit of everything. What he believes, by his own righteousness, what he feels right, he's willing to die for, basically. Right, and kill for. Um, yeah. What do, you, what do you like about this character? You know, one of the themes uh, is consequences, you know, our actions have results from those accidents, and sometimes they look a lot different than what you were hoping for. And so that's a, a theme that I find, you know, fascinating. I think everybody can relate to that. You have no idea how different the game is than the last time you played it. Have you worked with John in the, in the past, no, or was this the first time? No, I think we shot uh, four or five episodes, and then we broke for the pandemic. Then I got sick, and I... Two years passed before I went back to work, and John and I had not had any scenes together. You know, you were battling non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and then COVID. I mean, yeah. it was a year of 
tremendous um, trying health. Oh, I'll say. Yeah, well, you will. <laughs> Tell oh, me about man. it. Oh, man. And, you know, then there was, you know, the cancer and COVID. But between those was the chemo. And uh, what chemo does, it strips you of all your natural immune systems to get it to cancer. And so when I got COVID, I had no immune system we were working to fight it. And I got really, really sick. Touch, touch or go, whether I was going to make it or not. And at the same time, my wife got it, so we shared a, an ambulance to the hospital. <laughs> you know? How long were you in the hospital for? She was in for five days. I was in for about six weeks. Six weeks. So when I came back, we got to, you know, we had such a ball. And the scenes that uh, John Steinberg wrote are, you know, quite unusual for television. The, the experience overall doing TV this, this, this mm. time around was was what at the end of the day? Well, it was terrific. I had a lot of assumptions that it was going to be different than movies, but it wasn't. It had its own unique vibe, but it certainly was just as, you know, concentrated on making a great product. And it always sense you had enough time to do it. Uh, the people that were involved were, you know, top-notch people. It was... You know, just the same as making a movie, really. But it, but it was a, this idea of a, of a series, so there's a lot more time to develop a character and more twists and turns. What I'm built for is defending things. Defending. defending. All the best things I've done in my life have been in service of that. What a great interview. So good to hear from Jeff Bridges there. Thank you for that report, Phil. You can watch The Old Man on FX tonight or stream the first two episodes right now on Hulu. Well, now to that amazing rescue on the basketball court caught on camera, a player racing to save a referee who had collapsed. ABC's Trevor Alt has the story. The true heroics under pressure at a semi-pro basketball game in upstate New York. <laughs> Referee John Scully collapses mid-game. I was on the bench and I uh, see him go down, so my instincts kind of kick in. With others still unaware, Miles Copeland, a player for the Toledo Glass City Basketball Club, sprints into action. He doesn't have a pulse, he's not breathing. He started doing CPR, even using a defibrillator, even before EMS arrived, and in doing so, saved the ref's life, something he was unbelievably prepared to do because of his other job. What I was taught as a firefighter is to run towards the emergency, not run away from it. Back in Toledo, Miles works full time as a firefighter. In fact, he just finished a 24 hour shift the night before. He often misses games because he's on the job. Luckily, my schedule had lined up that day and good thing I was there and able to make the game because I was uh, able to help John and bring him back. Scully's fiance Donna Metz says he's undergoing surgery this morning and when fully recovered she's confident he'll be back on the court. His passion is officiating and he loves it. You know that feeling he gets out on the court being able to control the game there's just such a deep reality that John would not be here without Miles being there. That player and firefighter at the right place at the right time. Well, this Monday will be our country's first Juneteenth national holiday. President Biden signed the Juneteenth National Independence Day Act into law one year ago today. Tune in to ABC's in just a few minutes to watch Soul of a Nation presents Sound of Freedom, a Juneteenth celebration. But before we go tonight, the image of the day. This can also serve as a little friendly reminder to you too. Sunday is Father's Day. Kindergartners in East China's Shandong province, Providence play games with their dads to celebrate the day. How cute is that? Always nice to spend time with your dad. And I also want to give a shout out, you know what, to the, to the man I live with, my husband, who is an amazing father to our sons, uh, supportive, patient, always makes us laugh, and is always down for a game of Wii Tennis. I will beat you one day. Happy Father's Day, and happy Father's Day to all of the dads and all of the father figures out there. That is our show for this hour. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Stephanie Ramos. Thanks for streaming with us.
America's number one news, ABC.